Well, Jack, I think we're at that time to go ahead and, and get our, yes. our show started this Friday, this, the Ask and Answer episode uh, from our exclusive sponsor, the Fundraising Academy, uh, comes to our viewers and listeners every Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time and 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, let's just go ahead and, and get started. Uh, we have a, uh, an amazing cadre of co-hosts. Uh, that support the nonprofit show throughout the week. That's Mitch Stein, Mako Marquette Whitlocks, Meredith Tyrion, Sherry Quam Taylor, myself, and Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, all with great uh, experience in the nonprofit sector and, uh, and look forward to joining co hosts, uh, I mean, uh, guests, pardon me, <laughs> throughout the week. We also want to make sure that we thank our sponsors. Uh, these sponsors are very near and dear to my heart because of their commitment to professional development within the nonprofit sector. Uh, they definitely fuel the engine of the nonprofit show. And those sponsors are Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, the nonprofit show, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So a huge round of applause and thank you to our sponsors again that help bring this show uh, to our viewers and listeners uh, Monday through Friday every week. And again, I'm so excited to be here today with Jack Alato, CFRE, uh, representing the Fundraising Academy at National University. You are one of the Fundraising Academy's premier trainers. And, uh, and Jack, it's just great to have you here uh, for today's Ask and Answer and to have this conversation with you. So how yeah. are you and what's new and exciting? I'm, well, let me just say I'm honored to be here with you. My old friend, my colleague, a person who I've learned so much from in my own fundraising career. And it's good to see you. You look healthy. Of course, you're 3,500, actually more miles away from me than usual. But it's really good to see you, Tony. And I am honored to be your guest today. Well, I think the expectations are pretty high today, Jack, because I think we were referred to in, in some social media posts as the wise owls. So uh, <laughs> Nice. We, uh, we we definitely uh, have some <laughs> expectations to meet uh, through today's conversation. Uh, and Great. with that being said, are you, are you ready to kind of dive into yes. our, our first yeah, question? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's super. Let's do it. Okay, let's see here. So the first question is, we are being encouraged by our board to start up a young professionals board. The notion is that this will cultivate new leadership and younger donors. It would be managed by the development staff, which frankly seems like a lot of work. Do you have any input on this idea? And this is sent you to know, us from Name Withheld in Sacramento, California. So, Jack, what do you right. think about young professional so, boards? I, you know, I, I guess my first question is, why not just add them to your current board? Why, first of all, I don't know how you have two boards in a nonprofit organization. A board requires some bylaws, some um, Articles of incorporation. I mean, just add them to your current board if you've determined that they they are needed. But the the second thing I have to say is, how do you know you need young professionals? Is it just someone's idea? Have you conducted a board needs assessment and determined that young professionals are a demographic group that you want to include on your board, just like you would say um, members of. Uh, people of color or people from marginalized communities or LGBTQ. Another board sounds really cumbersome and I really don't know how that would work to have two boards. Tony, have you ever heard of two boards in a nonprofit? No, I, and I was, you know, pardon me, I was making notes too so I could make sure I followed up on some of the great stuff that you're saying. No, and, and that was the thing that really struck me about this question. I understand the desire for engaging young professionals as we talk about succession planning for our organization, and that's succession planning in terms of donors and, of course, in terms of, of leadership. Uh, but, but what struck me uh, is, I think, is similar to what you're saying, is the term board. So yeah. you don't want to you don't want to manage two boards. And also yeah. when you set up a young professional board, there is a level of, of expectation that comes with that word board and a level yeah. of accountability that I don't right. necessarily think they, they want the young professionals to have. Uh, so I right. have worked with organizations where we had a young professionals affinity group. 
you know, just you something go. that created yeah. a young professional's kind of network because they were all, they all, you know, their common commonality was their passion for that particular mission. So right. I, I think if, if name withheld were to consider something like a young professional's affinity group, uh, you know, that gives them kind of that, you know, that succession planning that they're looking for. Uh, but they got to make sure right. that it's a win-win for everybody. And there's good marketing yeah, opportunities absolutely. for business to business conversations. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think it's a great, I love advisory boards or affinity boards. A board has certain legal responsibilities. They have fiduciary responsibilities. And that person, this organization is in Sacramento, California. I know the laws of California. They're pretty strict as they relate to boards. So the idea, this is this as a secondary legal entity. I don't think so. But I do I like the Jack, idea of affinity groups. You, you've done a lot of you've done a lot of work in the Sacramento area. So it might be name withheld because you even know the organization. <laughs> I might. Yeah, no kidding. But no, it's 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 I'd be careful about do a board needs assessment, guys, and figure out what you need on your board, whether they're young or older or or people of color or accountants, lawyers, whatever you need, make sure that you do that board needs assessment first to determine what your needs are. Super. I totally agree with you. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. And then, you know, if they find that they don't need young professional professionals serving at the board level, then they can consider, you know, an affinity group or some type of advisory board uh, in order to, you know, to engage young professionals. So, uh, so I hope that that's helpful, helpful for Name yeah. Withheld in Sacramento. Yes, well, definitely. Yeah, we'll move on to the next one here. So this one is, uh, let's see, from Ginger. This time the city's withheld. Uh, I know this is a huge topic, but how do you feel about joint fundraising campaigns? We work in the human services area and are thinking about collaborating on a fall 2024 event that would support four shelters in our large community. Is this too risky or a smart and contemporary move? So I think it's a great idea. I love cooperation in fundraising. And when you have joint campaigns like this organization is suggesting, what you do is you, you will get new prospects, you will get new donors, and most importantly, you are going to get into new markets and the markets that your partners have that you are not already in. However, I think you need to have three important strategies, Tony, and tell me what you think as I go through them. I would expect that this campaign is going to add new prospects and new donors to your database. So the first strategy I really think you have to have is how will you cultivate those new prospects? How will you steward those new donors? That's those two strategies should be you should be thinking about before you do it. Put them in place. You're going to get new donors. How are you going to keep them? What are your stewardship plans for these new donors? And then the third thing, which I think is really important, is what messages do you want to bring to these new markets? Those three other shelters have markets that maybe you're not exactly in. Let's get those messages down before you enter those markets, because I think a whole world of opportunity, new donors, new prospects, new things, new ways of managing things are going to be really great for your organization. I'm so glad that you support this, Jack, because I, I do as well. I mean, anytime there's an opportunity for nonprofits to collaborate, uh, I am all, you know, again, all for that. I've had some history in this and working uh, once with, there were four different organizations, all, again, kind of serving the same community but in very different ways. Uh, and small nonprofits, not immediate, I mean, small grassroots organizations. So what we found was that each of those organizations had skills that the other didn't. So when they came yeah. together, one was really great at social media. Uh, one was really great at event logistics. And so yeah. when they brought all of those pieces together, they had this dynamite, like holistic you know, nice. approach that and, and opportunity uh, that they shared. So they learned a lot from one another in the process, you know, as yeah. well. Uh, and synergies and synergies. And, you know, I think the community of donors will say, oh, I'm so happy that these four organizations working with homelessness to end homelessness, 
uh, is it's such a beautiful thing. And donors are going to look at that. The public relations from that is going to be awesome. Your corporate funders are going to say, yes, this is what we like to see. This co collaboration is so important. It, it really is. The, the other thing I might say, just based on some of my experiences in, in this space with, with these types of collaborations, is don't forget that you're still running a business. So in the collaboration that I mentioned, we had a partnership agreement between yeah. the, the organizations that were collaborating, especially when you're talking about what's going to happen to that that attendee list after the event or, you know, or the campaign, right? So if it's an event or campaign, you know, what's, how are we sharing the information? Yeah. Uh, how are we sharing the funds? Uh, again, who, who's owning what and doing what? So, uh, so yeah. I would encourage Ginger to also think about the business components of this collaboration and look, and it doesn't have to be something complicated, but just something that clearly defines the expectations of everyone's role and participation and how everyone's going to manage the outcomes together. And you know what, Tony, that should have been my fourth strategy. Having that agreement in place is brilliant. And thank you for bringing it up. I'm sorry I didn't think of that. But here it's such an important thing that where you outline the parameters of this uh, this relationship, the information you're going to share, all of those things, you've nailed it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was that was one of the most challenging pieces, quite honestly, again, from my experience, was just kind of getting that, you know, getting consensus on what that looks like. Uh, and in, in many cases, uh, you know, the executive directors were aligned, but, but uh, you know, these things need to you know, have the conversation with your board and, and board members tended to be a little uh, more skeptical than the EDs or CEOs around the collaboration. So, uh, you know, it, it may not be easy initially, but it's time well spent uh, to make sure that everybody, you know, understands what their roles are. Yeah, absolutely. Good points. So hopefully that's good for Ginger, you know, it's city with, withheld. Uh, Definitely. You know, but, but totally support it, right? Anytime you can collaborate, 100% yeah. all about that. Yes, <laughs> totally. Let's see here. So oh, another name withheld. How do you feel about doing direct appeals in digital and print from the desk of the CEO? I'm talking about the type that is in letter form and seems to be a business format. I'm not sure if this is a very current way to go, but our CEO does have a strong community brand and people like her. Yeah, and I think the, the last sentence tells it all for me. She has a strong community brand and people like her. So get her out there, whether it's digital or in business letter format, direct mail campaigns, speaking engagements. She absolutely should be in front of the public as far as I'm concerned. Part of this question, I'm not sure if they're asking about the format that they should bring the CEO to the organ to the community or is it a question about whether the CEO should engage in this type of fundraising? To the latter point, yes, the CEO should be engaged in fundraising. Fundraising is a team sport. She's got some community uh, great uh, brand and recognition. So use her as best you can. And whatever format is wor works for your donor base, for your community, then put her out there in that format. Absolutely. But ah, right. I mean, that's the thing is how do your donors each want to receive the information? So I think the question, Jack, like you're saying, digital and print, I'm going to assume that that means there are some donors that want an email and that, you know, yep. the letter can be attached digitally, you know, in an email. Other donors may respond more so from a print, you know, that that's arriving via postal service. Uh, but it, but either way, Yes, take advantage of uh, or maximize, I should say, uh, you know, your CEO's brand and, and likability uh, in the community and, and definitely, definitely go for it. Jack, what would you oh. say? Let's take this a, a, just a little bit deeper. Uh, and, and what would be some of the compelling points that might be in this letter? When you think of a compelling letter from a direct appeal from a CEO, what are the, some of the key components 
that a CEO should have in that letter? Well, I think I think one of the really important things is to tell a story. <laughs> Storytelling in fundraising is one of the most del- and neglected art forms as far as I could tell. I just was reading an article not too long ago this morning that uh, about the value of storytelling in connecting donors to the mission, the vision, and the values of the organization, and how stories really in, in, involve us emotionally in, in what the mission is. I think that's really important. And always, whatever it is, whatever you're writing, you always have to connect to the purpose of your organization, whether it's in letter form or via email or text message, whatever it is, it must connect to purpose. Uh, There are lots of things, lots of other ways that this CEO connect, Tony, and you probably could think of many. She could have a column in the newsletter that that maybe comes out quarterly or whenever. Um, She should have definitely a letter to in the annual report, a letter to donors talking about the challenges and the absolute problems that she faces in her job. Challenges and successes are really important. I think donors really want to hear about challenges. We neglect to tell them about the the things that we face in our work as a nonprofit executive. So I think all of those things would really be something that donors and prospective donors Corporate donors, et cetera, foundations would really want to hear about from this um, great CEO. She sounds like if she's got a brand in the community and people love her and like her, I think that definitely I'd put her out there. Yeah. And the other thing, it seems so obvious, you know, when we're talking about a direct appeal, but making sure there's a call to action you know, within the communication as well. It's, you know, I've read this great story. So now what? Right. Yeah. What is your expectation of me now that you've you've heightened my senses and and my passions overflowing? <laughs> you know what next? Uh, Absolutely. You know, call so to action next- is such a critical, important th- part of any fundraising appeal, and mm-hmm. it should be in every single. You know what? You've heard the story. Now, what can this person reading this do to make it better to impact this client, these mm-hmm. beneficiaries, etc. So I would say for names withheld, you know, name withheld that uh, it is definitely still a current way to go, right? Because there seemed to be a question about is this, you know, is this too old school? Uh, but there's, you know, uh, but definitely, you know, lead into it as you said, Jack. If this is the type of, you know, of appeal, digital or print, that you feel like your donors will be responsive to, based on what you know about your donors, right? Yes. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Take a deep breath. We're going to move on to the next one. Okay. All righty. Oh, and this one is for you specifically, Jack. Oh, yeah. Wow. This is interesting. Yeah. This is a question for Jack. How has presenting <laughs> at conferences helped your career? You seem to be a confident speaker. Yeah. I'm curious how this helps you professionally and if your organization values this extra work. I'm thinking about submitting some speaking proposals, but I don't know how it will impact my career. This is from Samantha in Dallas, Texas. So what advice do you have for Samantha? Definitely submit those speaking proposals, number one. I I will tell you this. I love speaking at conferences, Tony. You're so great at it. Not not only because of the, the knowledge I share, but also for the knowledge I receive. It's a two way process. You know, both of us have trained large audiences and the questions they ask challenge me to understand better this profession that you and I have chosen. You know, I see it as a mutual learning experience Mm -hmm. and I totally recognize the value of a participatory engagement process. I don't want to stand up there and lecture. I want to hear from them. I want the audience to engage, be active in the process. I want them to help create their own knowledge about whatever the topic is. Here's the second thing. I love getting a topic I know little about. Right. Because when I get a topic that I have to go out and research, one of the things I'm working on right now that I'm 
become very interested in is donor personas. So now I have to go out and do my homework, understand what exactly that is. And I definitely think it will impact your career because you go put it on your resume and send it to someone else. The other thing, Tony, and finally, I love to co-present mm -hmm. and bond with my colleagues, former adult learners, study group participants. And by the way, Tony, when are you and I going to co-present something, whether at ICON or Cultivate or our lead conference or some conference? I am asking you publicly right now, when are you and I going to co-present, Tony? Well, not soon enough, because I know the last <laughs> time we did, we had the best time together. Uh, and I think that that was at AAFP Icon a few years ago. We, yes. we co-presented yeah. together. Uh, yes. But you said so many great things there, Jack. And, and I think one of the important, important pieces is to think about the fact that you're having a conversation with your audience, right? You're not standing there lecturing them. And there's a big difference in those approaches. Uh, so really just taking kind of a conversational approach to your presentation, preventing, you know, I mean, providing a lot of space for questions uh, and for folks to, you know, to engage. Uh, yeah. Also remembering that you're there as the subject matter expert, not a not the know-it-all. Right. So embracing the fact that there may be times where you might have to say, I'm not really sure about that, but let me get back to you. Exactly. Uh, or I have no idea, does anyone else in the room have an answer to that question? So there have been times where, you know, I have kind of volleyed it back to the audience and said, yep. who can answer that? Right. Yeah. So, you know, so just making and, sure. And that... some of those answers are better than the ones I would give. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know the feeling 100 percent. So uh, so I would say, you know, also just, you know, not being uh, ashamed, for lack of a better term, to say, I, I don't know that. And then, you know, yeah. throw it back to uh, to the audience and see if someone else in the audience might know, you know, right. the, the answer to that. And uh, and. Uh, Submit those proposals, submit those proposals, create those abstracts, follow their guidelines, you know, talk to them, communicate, whether it's AFP or, or, or AHP or CASE or whatever it is. I, you know, I uh, in October, I'm going to present at a conference of people who are involved with training dogs, dogs who are involved with either uh, assisting people who have diabetes or COVID or whatever. And I, I'm excited to get into a room with people who are doing such important work, you know, right. like, and I'm a dog at lover. I know you yes. are as well. And I like cats. I actually, I like all animals, birds too, you, you know, so it's just an opportunity to get in front of a group of people who might be in a different area of fun, you know, a different type of organization than the one you are working with. Mm -hmm. So and learn from those people. I have listen, the blessings that I've received are much greater, I think, than the blessings I might be giving the, the audience. It's just a wonderful way to interact with people and to make new friends and learn oh, new yeah. things. Yeah, for sure. What do you think, Jack? Because you brought up something really important that is uh, part of the process of getting selected and considered to speak and present at, at, at some of these conferences and that is the abstract. So yes. what kind of advice would you give Samantha when she thinks about crafting her, her abstract, you know, for, for some of these great speaking opportunities? And, and the abstract, I think, is, a, you know, three or four paragraphs, short paragraphs about what the topic is. But more important, the final things, and Tony, you've done this, and I've done it many times in, at our work, um, is to the key takeaways. What are people gonna take back to their own work in fundraising? That is such important an important thing. And the third, the other thing that I think is really important is how the audience is going to participate in this uh, seminar, webinar, whatever it is, because I think we're working with adults and adults are not fifth graders that want to be lectured to. They want to participate in this process of learning. And they learn by doing. 
So if you could include some things in that abstract key takeaways, things that they're going to take away when they're, they're if it's, let's say it's about creating a, a stewardship plan, mm -hmm. then they're going to get a template that they're going to leave with to help them create a stewardship plan or a cultivation plan or how to ask. I recently did in Canada a presentation on donor signals. I loved it. You know, things that they're going to be verbal and nonverbal Mm -hmm. uh, cues that are going to tell them the donor is ready to get that ask. And I, I, you know, how are they going to bring that back to their own work? What cues are they going to look for when they're presenting to a prospective donor? Mm -hmm. So remember those things, make it, make it something that they could take back to their work. And I always ask that question. I think I've attended some of your webinars, Tony, where you asked that question at the end. What are you going to bring back to your work at your nonprofit? I think that question is so important. That last slide that says, what are you going to take back to your work in your nonprofit that's going to help you be better at your work? I'm glad that you mentioned that, Jack, you know, the, the takeaways. And I, uh, I'm glad we had the time to go a little bit deeper into some of these conversations, too, because hopefully that'll help Samantha, you know, uh, you know, craft these abstracts that are just going to, to get her these these speaking gigs left and right. Uh, so yes. Samantha, best of luck. Samantha from Dallas, Texas. We look forward to seeing you speak at AFP ICON yes. or, uh, or at any other conferences. Please follow up with Jack and I and let us know where you're speaking yes. so that we can either zoom in or, or you know, uh, support you from afar. So best of luck to, you know, Samantha uh, as she strives uh, to get these speaking engagements. Great. Let's see what up oh, and Jack, that's it. Can you yes. believe it goes by so fast, right? <laughs> I know. When am I going to see you again, old friend? I don't know, but but soon we'll follow up afterwards and we'll uh, we'll yeah. definitely get something scheduled, even if it's just the two of us on a Zoom just to, to catch that up properly. Good. But, uh, but again, good. it's been such a, a pleasure. Jack Alato, CFRE, Fundraising Academy trainer at National University. Uh, Jack, again, it's always such a pleasure. You bring so much incredible information uh, to the sector and, um, and just the value that you bring to the CFRE program, uh, you know, that could be a whole show in itself. So just thank you so much for everything that you do to make people better and to make the sector better. It's been so much thank fun you. chatting with you today. <laughs> Same here. Same here. And then again, you know, we want to thank our sponsors, Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, the Nonprofit Show, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and JMT Consulting. So once again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today at the Nonprofit Show. Uh, keep up all the great work. And as we like to say, uh, just be well so you can do well. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.